In the series' return to the airport circuit known as Circuit Icar, restarts are chaotic, cars are sliding all over the place, the points leader keeps consistent after a recent appeal victory, and the driver of the new number 74 Napa Auto Parts Dodge wins at a road course for the third time this season. How's it going y'all? Welcome to another NASCAR Pinty Series race review. It's Riegser here, and today's review and analysis focuses on the recent General Tire 125 at Circuit Icar in Mirabel, Quebec. Race 11 of 13, so let's get straight into the video. To quickly recap the previous race, the series made its debut on dirt with Race 10 at Oshwickin Speedway in Ontario, and it was as awesome as it could get. With near 5 wide racing, many dirt racing legends clashing hard throughout the field, and none other than Trayton Lapsevich finally getting a second career win, beating Stuart Friesen in a wild finish. The points were quite the headline kerfuffle over the course of a few hours on, I think it was August 17th, the day after the Oshwigan race, where it was revealed that the National Motorsports Appeal Panel had accepted appeals from both Alex Tagliani and Mark Antoine Cameron over specific points penalties that were handed to them after the race in Edmonton. Both were 12 point penalties, however, Tagliani's penalty was for intentionally retaliating against Brendan Watson due to a prior incident, and Cameron's penalty was for something illegal in the car. Tagliani went from tied in third to taking it from Trayton Lapsevich and being 8 points behind the two leaders, Cameron and DJ Kennington, who are tied. Or at least were tied. Then, Cameron's appeal result is revealed, and he gains 12 points on Kennington. Reportedly, the garage was not happy about Cameron's appeal win, and it's caused many people to question the integrity of Pinty Series officiating. Have the calls been fair? Is there a new norm now? Will illegal moves, whether it's wrecking someone or putting in a bad park, quote-unquote, be more okay now? It's hard to say on my end, as someone who isn't nowhere near the garage, I literally live like a couple provinces away, so you can interpret it uh, all of this however you want to. Alright, I felt it was necessary to explain all that for things to make sense moving forward, so let's get into the weekend of Circuit Icar, starting with the entry list and its most notable areas. Justin Arsenault makes his Pinty Series debut in the number 03 car, coming in with experience from racing at the track itself, in its own racing series, along with karting as a young kid, and even participating in eSports. If you watched the NASCAR Xfinity Series at Daytona this past weekend, you'll notice that a familiar name is right here. As per usual, Alex LeBay ran the number 36 for DGM Racing, owned by Canadian man Mario Gosselin, and finished 8th despite being caught up in multiple incidents in what was an absolute wreckfest of a race, which ended just before 2am Eastern. Imagine after all the big hits and likely some lack of sleep that he suffered, he would fly over to Quebec and perhaps, like, obliterate the field. Matthew Kingsbury, LP Montour, and Trois Rivières race winner Alex Gannett are back as the usual road course aces, and Serge Bordeaux makes his second star of the year after unfortunately crashing out a GP3R. Other than that, it's just the regular drivers. 23 cars, not bad. In practice, which as a matter of fact ended up being a hot lap session because rain canceled qualifying, Kevin Lacroix was the fastest by a distance of 0.087, beating Mark Antoine Cameron and Alex Tagliani. Alex LeBay, Justin Arsenault, and Matthew Kingsbury are some nice names to see in the top 10. Trayton Lapsevich and Brandon Watson were left to be desired. For now. The starting lineup was to be determined by the point standings, therefore, a front row of Cameron and DJ Kennington. Note that Alex LeBay had to start 22nd of 23 cars. That'll be quite the detail to remember for later. The trend that this year's race at Circuit Icar featured was... Chaotic restarts and average racing? Sure, there was a lot of slipping and sliding for the kind of course it is. Maybe the rain from earlier didn't help at all. If you're a weather expert, I know I'm not. You'll probably know it better than me. I have no idea what happened with Alex Tagliani on the start, but it didn't stop him from going to second on the next long straightaway, and Ninja Ranger was the first man to attempt a three-wide maneuver around the outside in the first corner, and it seemingly worked. Cameron led for a couple of laps, then Kevin Lacroix's dominance from the hot lap session came in hand and was the story of the race from there on out. The only big headlines, if anything, that weren't the restarts were Sam Fellows having his day end early due to a broken drive shaft, man will this guy ever have any luck, and Glenn Styers causing a caution with 20 laps remaining as he too slowed down to a halt. Both cautions led to restarts where at least one driver used a full send to either steal the lead from Lacroix or gain further positions. 
The first man was Tagliani, with him looking as though he wanted to send the GM Payakars into the Shadow Realm, and the second man was Ranger, who then lost the lead back to Lacroix within a lap. Also in that same restart, a breaking lockup caused Cameron to nearly be literally ass-packed by Tagliani. What was it with Tagliani and GM Paye that day? From there, not much else happened besides a Justin Arsenault spin, which I have no clue if it was contact or if it was on his own. It's a bummer because he had top 10 pace at one point. So, overall, not the most entertaining race if you look at it from a certain perspective. Kevin Lacroix goes on to win, no shocker at all. But overall, not the most entertaining race if you look at it from a certain perspective. Many past races at the track are well known for maybe 3-4 to four cars in a close pack of most runs, and the crazy finishes, particularly including Lacroix and or Ranger. The thing is though, does all of this mean it was a bad race per se? Well, it wasn't awful by any means, but looking at long green flag runs plus lead battles a few seconds off a restart, it wasn't near as close to other road courses like Canadian Tire Motorsport Park or Trois Rivières. Maybe weather played a factor, as was said earlier, but who knows. To confirm, the track will return on the 2023 schedule. With all that said and done, let's take a look at the results. Nice to see Alex Gannett score a podium finish after his upset of a victory at GP3R. If I had to be honest, I wonder what he'd look like in a full-time ride. Anyone want to help fill me in on if he has any good oval experience? Does he have good results? Someone tell me. Well, LeBay didn't obliterate the field, but he definitely made his way up. <laughs> How do you go from 22nd, aka 2nd to last, to 4th? I mean, yeah, in 70 laps, for a former series champion, that is not much to him, but holy hell, that is a huge rebound for the number 07 car after Jacques Villeneuve couldn't even run a single lap at GP3R. Again, an early morning finish at Daytona, and then flying to Quebec for Pinties. That is sick. <laughs> Brandon Watson hasn't been the greatest on road courses this year, so a 9th place finish is very solid. Good finishes for Dexter Stacey and LP Montour, and I gotta say, Stacey has been a lot better than expected on the road courses especially, so awesome to see him performing like this. Gary Clute's luck remains unfortunate as he finishes 34 laps down and has only one top 10 in the last 5 races, compared to 3 top 5s and 6 top 10s in the first 6 races. It really does suck because he was looking like such an underdog early on and was a candidate to use consistency as a championship strategy. Looking at the new points, yeah, it's it's not really new at the top. Mark Antoine Cameron is looking like the champion at this point. I mean, sure, little catastrophe at most sport and Delaware could happen, but he could also win one or bo even both races or simply just finish high like he has in the most races this season. It's been a constant pattern of top fives and the occasional win that comes around every now and then. Now it's really become a battle for second place as there's three drivers in a five point area that could take the position. Anything that happens to them, Lapsevich and Ranger are ready to strike. The latter could be quite the story after what was such an inconsistent and unlucky first half of his campaign. LP Doomland's usual pattern of consistency every year with maybe one or two wins seems to have finally been beaten in a way this year, as every other driver above him has won either one or multiple races, and with consistency being added on to those campaigns, the competition factor has played hard against the defending champion. You may either call Cameron a champion, or you may make the most unrealistic but still possible predictions ever. It's whatever route you choose to go down. I mean, this season's been filled with drama the whole way through, and with where we head next, it's yet to stop. The series returns to Canadian Tire Motorsport Park for a second race at the circuit. Once again, or perhaps you're a newbie here so I won't leave you out, 10 corners of many lefts and rights, with multiple elevation changes, slipping and sliding through many turns, and some notable ones in particular, including the Moss Corner Hill, the Long Mario Andretti Straightaway, and White's Corner, which has had its fair share of historical finishes, whether it's in the Pinty series or top-level third-tier Camping World Truck series. One of these happened back in May, and I'm sure one driver in particular will remember it. A potential entry list has been released, credit to Cam K from the NASCAR Pinty Series Facebook community. Most notably, TJ Renomato returns after being absent for two races, and father, Peter, or brother Ryan of Gary will run the number 6 car. The road course aces for this one look to be Ray Jr. Court Mosh, LP Montour, Daniel Boy, Alex Gannett, Brent Weller, and Matthew Scannell. 
When looking at historical winners for both races this year, the top contenders include Kevin Lacroix, LP Dumoulin, Alex Tagliani, and a couple others. Go figure, Mark Antoine Cameron won the second race in 2021, so he could very well get the job done come this Sunday. But personally, I want to keep an eye on Gary Clute. He's won here before. I mean, it was kind of a fluke in a way, but I mean, he was in the position to be ready just in case the two leaders clashed. And he came so damn close to winning the first race this year. But of course, Kevin Lacroix said hello. Does he get his revenge this time around? Could maybe someone else come through in surprise, like a rogue horse ace? Like, will someone do a 2.0 of Alex Gannett? You can get all those questions and scenarios answered by remembering to tune in once again if you can, whether it's on tsn.ca, the TSN app, or Flow Racing, which all do require subscription, by the way, and continue to show your support for the NASCAR Pinty series in whatever way you choose to do so. So, that's gonna do it for this one. You got any thoughts? Leave them in the comments below. And if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe, and also, give this a thumbs up. My name's Reekser, or Reeks for short, and thank you for watching. Have a good one.